Hello, welcome to the kickoff of season two of Perspectives Live. I am so happy to be here. I'm Angela Selvaraja, your host for the new season. This show is an initiative by Colleges and Institutes Canada, CICAN, a place where we can talk and, and talk about and share different perspectives on what matters to you. Uh, today's episode is on where are we heading? Uh, before we get started, I wish to acknowledge that this episode of Perspectives Live is being produced and broadcast from the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. A uh, CICAN would like to recognize the ongoing contributions of its corporate partners, AV, uh, Avis Budget, uh, BGIS, Field Effect, and TD, who support CICAN's activities, including bringing you Perspectives Live. And now I'm joined by the president and CEO of CICAN, Denise Amio. Hello, Denise. How do you feel about launching season two of Perspectives Live? Oh, Denise, I think you may be muted. I have to say this to you. I say this once during every session that I host. I think I think it'll sound better once we can hear your voice. Yes, I'm sorry. Oh, I should that's know much better. better. <laughs> you after, know what, Denise? After... This happens to me happens to me <laughs> once every session. So I'm gonna have to do it again. <laughs> believe me. Uh, and for me, it happens to me once a day, at least, <laughs> even <laughs> after 20 months. So when I'm the extreme. pandemic is over, we when the pandemic is over and we don't have to use any of these, then we'll figure it out, right? You bet, you bet. So to answer your questions, um, I am extremely, extremely excited uh, to launch season two of our show. Uh, you know, for the first show, uh, we had a, a record setting first season. And now we're back. We're back with an exciting new lineup um, for our innovative and interactive web TV series Perspectives Live. The show will continue to take advantage of what our new digitally enhanced world has to offer in order for us to be able to connect leaders, connect experts from the post-secondary sector, but also from government, industry, businesses and uh, different stakeholders on hot topics that matter the most to the college and institute system. So after 20 months of a pandemic, we have a minority government again, newly elected. We have seen societal issues. We've seen tragedies. So we thought the best topic we could choose for this uh, first episode is really where are we heading as a country? So the format of the show has changed a little bit to allow more time for guest speakers to share their unique perspectives in a conversation with you, Manjula, after which I will join the conversation with a college president. So today we are very, very pleased to have Don Lovisa, who is the president of Durham College in Ontario and a member of Colleges Institutes Canada Board of Directors. That's wonderful. Uh, thanks, Denise. I, and you'll be back with us shortly. I'm now excited to introduce and welcome our two guest speakers. Uh, Carol Saab is the Chief Executive Officer of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, and Paul Wells is the Senior Editor of McLean's. Hello. Hi. Hello. Really glad to have you with us. Um, I know, Carol, it's a really busy week for you because you, your, uh, the organization has a sustainability conference uh, that's going on. So, so glad you could you could join us. Let me set the the context here. We have a federal election that resulted in another liberal minority government. Uh, rising vaccination rates are bringing us closer to the end of the pandemic in Canada. At least we hope so. What does the road ahead look like for for Canada, uh, Carol? Let me start with you. Sure. Thanks very much, Manjula. And I'm I'm equally uh, pleased and happy to be here. Thank thank you uh, for the invitation. Um, and I'll start also by acknowledging that I I am also in my home office located in Ottawa, which is on the uh, unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation. 
Uh, to your question, I, I'm spending a lot of time, aren't we all, thinking about what the road ahead looks like after this this massive uh, change that we're all uh, still unpacking and trying to understand. And I'll tell you, when I think about it, it gives me um, maybe equal parts goosebumps and heartburn. And I'll tell you why. The the goosebumps part of it is is that I really fundamentally believe that we we are on the precipice here. We have a massive opportunity for transformation if we're deliberate about it. And I know we'll get, again, an opportunity to unpack that a bit more as we speak. And the heartburn is because I'm worried we're going to miss it. It's it, it feels increasingly like a narrow window. And as with many sort of change initiatives, the inertia of just, you know, how fast can we get back to how things were um, is real is real and i think we we owe it to ourselves uh, to really think about how where do we want to get you know we're we're at a place right now the rate of change is unprecedented it's creating challenges it's creating opportunities uh it's presenting major legal ethical uh, social economic dilemmas and the impact is being felt everywhere in workplaces uh, public transit transportation infrastructure energy you know, economic development and more, and, and that's impacting government, governments, businesses, uh, citizens, all of us really across the board having to make choices about how we're going to respond to this, to, to technology changes, to the economic inequality um, that we're experiencing and seeing in a, in a more vivid lens, um, and to this change. And, and I think we can recognize the seeds of some of that in our current reality. You know, reconciliation with Indigenous communities has become a significant national priority. Um, and there are still substantial barriers to improving quality of life on and off reserves. We have a aging population uh, and increased income inequality. Both things are going to put pressure on our social safety net. New Canadians, you know, refugees are going to continue to arrive in larger numbers. Uh, climate change and its impacts are going to touch every community in Canada in different ways. And so, I mean, I'll take a minute in this sort of table setting question to also sort of extend the question out a bit to say, what have we learned? What have we learned from this last period of time? And one of the things certainly from, from my vantage point um, I can attest to is that we've seen orders of government um, and across sectors, really, folks working more closely together than before. Uh, the safe restart agreements that came together in the summer are a good example of that. The rapid housing initiative where we saw sort of really unprecedented collaboration, even us as an organization partnering with the Canadian Medical Association in new ways uh, to, I mean, I, I think really simply put, we figured out how to get out of our own way across the board in jurisdictions and sectors um, with really centering on how do we keep Canadians safe? How do we deliver on important things for Canadians fast? Because it was needed, because it was urgent. And I think it behooves us all across all sectors, across all orders of government to figure that out. And so what we're hearing at a local order of government level is that people are worried about their economy, about their businesses. Uh, from a community's perspective, people have now sort of understood in a different way the value of their local amenities um, and want to help keep them strong. And I think that for, for me, I hope that helps people see a, a different view of the effectiveness, the importance of local government. You know, they've seen their local leaders out there delivering concretely, keeping people safe, helping the most vulnerable, helping those, those frontline services to keep going strong. And I hope that gives us a taste of what's possible if we can continue to, to do that kind of work. Um, and I'll, I'll just highlight other themes that I hope we come back to, Mangela, because I want to I sort of give mm -hmm. space here. One is equity. You know, I, we're hearing a lot. I'm guilty myself of saying I hope this is a turning point. Well, it's only going to be a turning point if we make it so. That includes reconciliation. Uh, you know, and the last thing maybe I'll surface in terms of where are we heading and, and to your point around the federal election and the impacts there. Uh, certainly, as an organization, we're keeping a close eye on, on this sort of emergent and, and sort of exacerbated rural-urban divide in Canada. There was a growing uh, conversation and trend uh, about people feeling disconnected from their fellow Canadians, depending on where they live. That's particularly visible between communities of different sizes. But, you know, and I'll end with this, I need to tell you something on that front. I, I in my position, have the privilege of sitting around a, a very big table with people from communities of all sizes. And there, you know, no doubt there are issues on which folks differ. But at their core, and I think what we've learned, and I hope it's where we're headed, is that everyone wants to find a path forward that advances everyone inclusively. And so I'll end there, but happy to unpack some of those themes as we go. That's a, that's a lot, it is certainly. And you know, with the urban rural divide, you're right, that is something that we're seeing more. And, and 
And I will make a point to come back to that in a minute. Uh, Paul, I I'd love to get you to weigh in. What does the road ahead look like for Canada? What are you seeing? Um, uh, I also want to thank uh, CI Canada for inviting me and thank you, Mangela, for hosting us. And it's uh, it's uh, um, flattering and a little intimidating to be sharing the, the, the floor with Carol Sab, who always comes uh, highly uh, uh, prepared and full of insights for things like this. I think the I think the road ahead looks difficult, and um, and, uh, and this is almost a truism, so a, a little hard to predict. Nobody could have predicted the last eighteen months. Nobody could have predicted at the federal politics level the six months that preceded the outbreak of the uh, of the pandemic. I mean, remember that we came out of the twenty nineteen federal election with a string of crises that would have been uh, very difficult to prepare for. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, you know, serious strains in the Federation, thanks to the result of the election, followed by the shooting down of the uh, Ukrainian airliner over uh, Iran that, uh, uh, you know, the very large number of passengers on that airliner were, um, were Canadian. And then the uh, nationwide uh, um, uh, uh, protests against, uh, against freight uh, rail uh, in solidarity uh, with uh, the Wet'suwet'en and the British Columbia, uh, which nearly brought the uh, food supply chain of the country to a grinding halt, and and and, uh, and and was very tricky for the federal government. I raise all that simply to say it's uh, tempting to think that we can draw sweeping conclusions about what's going to come, but we've been lousy at predicting what's what just happened. And mm. um, I, I I do think you know. So with that you know very large caveat. I think we're heading uh, closer to a world in which uh, um, the economy is going to return closer to, to, to what it was before the pandemic. Uh, people's uh, uh, social uh, and uh, economic and spending habits are going to return closer to what happened before the pandemic. But I, for one, have been very skeptical about the notion that we're heading into a world of particular opportunity. The mm -hmm. analogy that a lot of people draw is to the immediate post-World War II uh, uh, policy landscape in Canada. It's a tempting analogy because um, we're coming out of uh, one of the deadliest events in Canadian history, and the last one that was on that scale was the Second World War. The Second World War was different in almost every other way. It was a time of uh, widespread uh, infrastructure devastation, which has no parallel to today. Uh, Canada and the world has been hit with a kind of a neutron bomb that uh, uh, um, substantially depressed human activity, but has not left, uh, has not unbuilt the infrastructure that we had. So um, people who, who are hoping for a, 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 a new world of um, widespread green transport technology and things like that, unfortunately, we're stuck with the infrastructure we had and it, and it hasn't gone away. Secondly, um, the post-World War II landscape was a landscape of, um, uh, uh, essentially almost entirely undone work on on things like pensions and, and income support things like that it was it was uh, uh, uncharted territory for Western governments and uh, Canadian British European governments were able to move into the social policy space with public pensions um, uh, public uh, health care and things like that in in bold ways because there was there there, there was um, there was no antecedent for that. Whereas the policy field in Canada is already very crowded. And the questions that we're mm -hmm. facing now are things like, uh, at what speed can we unwind the income supports that we've had? Um, and, 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 um, and there's an increasingly robust debate with strong uh, uh, arguments on both sides of that question, because you can't just shut that mm -hmm. stuff down right now. Um, mm -hmm. But at the same time, you can't forever uh, sustain the level of spending that those programs have required. And so we're, we're heading into some difficult debates on that. Finally, another reason I'm skeptical of the notion of uh, sort of brave new world awaiting us is we got into this mess by ignoring uh, some of the less glamorous obligations that had been around forever, like proper long term care like uh, uh, manufacturing supply chains that made sense and were resilient and could adjust to change. And, um, uh, um, and pandemic preparedness, which uh, was constantly shunted off to the side because uh, there were more glamorous, frankly, more polling friendly 
uh, public health challenges that governments were more excited to, 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 to tackle. Uh, Jane Philpott told me that when she was federal health minister, every time she went to a G7 or a G20 summit, uh, they spent a half a day wargaming a pandemic uh, that in its uh, mm -hmm. particulars looked very much like the one we ended up in. And then she would go back to Ottawa and her cabinet colleagues would ask her about vaping and we would ask her about uh, vaping and the opioid crisis and real, real challenges. But um, uh, uh, I, I think one of the roles of community colleges and, and uh, similar institutions in Canada, one of the roles of journalists and other watchdogs is to remember that uh, we had a long term care crisis in this country for 60 years. We uh, ignored obvious lessons about how to prepare for a major uh, viral catastrophe uh, in the face of expert evidence for a long time. And um, uh, a, a lot of the uh, work that's going to need to be done uh, going forward is not going to be glamorous. It's not going to feel like the future. Uh, but if we don't dot our I's across our T's, um, we're going to find that we regret that lost effort soon enough. Okay, I, I think I can describe that as a, as a pessimistic view. It's interesting that, that sometimes I think that this description of a, a brave new world is us just trying to be optimistic because we're in trying times. Uh, so I, I find that very interesting. So, so let me put this to both of you. Um, you know, you've painted a, a picture of a really difficult road ahead. How does Canada compare globally with our G7 partners and, and, and other countries? Uh, uh, Carol, maybe I'll start with you. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Manjula. And I think, um, you know, Paul spoke uh, sort of quite well to the heartburn aspect of, of the picturing the road mm. ahead. And he's he's quite right. I agree with him in his assessment that these things were not emerging with these things or, you know, organically or magically as, as a course of this conversation. And in fact, really what we've seen like is sort of the inequity that that has um, plagued us for a very long time on more vivid display. And so hopefully um, what we can do is catalyze a readiness for change. Yeah, the fact that folks are, have sort of felt this in realer terms um, and seen it in, in different ways to, to move forward. You know, your question on, on G7, it's a big one, and it depends, I, I guess, on what aspect you're looking at. And so I'll give you a few indicators that I think are relevant to some of the thematics that, that we've talked about. Um, one, obviously not surprising coming coming from me, it would be around infrastructure investment. And, you know, actually, we compare reasonably well um, to peer, peer economies. You know, McKinsey's done a ranking. We're about middle of, of the G20 with public and private investment and infrastructure. Um, and so that, you know, puts us uh, slightly above the U.S. and U.K. La last time I looked. And, I, you know, there's there's certainly room for us to improve. Another sort of on the worrying side of this, we have among the highest per capita GHG emissions as an indication of how we compare internationally on the climate file. Um, so that, you know, certainly underlines we have a lot more work to do to do there. Um, an area where we're also, again, further behind is, is on uh, broadband infrastructure deployment. You know, the World Economic Forum has ranked Canada below the OECD average on digital competitiveness. Uh, obviously, we're all uh, learning very quickly in real time crash course here on the necessity of, of being on the front edge of that, um, given the reality we've all lived in the past 20 months. And we know that in Canada, we've got a long way to go to reach some pretty basic service objectives. And so, you know, that's that's another area I would highlight. Um, and I think really to your question, I think we've got some some thinking to do. Where do we want to be leaders when we're when we're asking questions like this? And and I would suggest as as um, someone who really sees this as a baseline necessity for all of these challenges we've spoken to, um, is thinking about housing affordability. You know, between 2005 and, and 2019, we recorded one of the largest increases over 80% in housing prices in the OECD. Um, and so as someone who thinks that adequate housing is a baseline necessity um, for so many of the issues we hope to tackle and, and as a nation, uh, if you ask me, I'd say let's start there. It's interesting. Um, I, I, I agree with you. I, I do think that the pandemic has really exposed those fault lines that were in place already. Right, Paul, you know, um, there was an article that you wrote right after the election. I'm going to read a, a line from it, a couple of lines from it, because I, I really actually, um, when I got to those lines, really affected me. Um, this is what you say. We could actually use a real discussion about what happens next. 
Is it mass for everyone forever? Is there a quantum of risk that's low enough that we can get back to living more or less um, the way we used to? Um, are we anywhere close to that blessed day? Your words in McLean's, I, I, as I said before, I really felt those lines as I was uh, reading them. What are your thoughts on if policymakers are having those real discussions and, and doing the real thinking about what happens next? Uh, I don't think our um, federal politics um, is well equipped for the kind of sort of um, thoughtful conversations about difficult questions uh, like the ones you quoted. Um, uh, but I do think that Parliament's better is a better place for it than political campaigns. That piece was in, in general despairing about how uh, even a, a flawed uh, national conversation just uh, um, uh, turns into a, a, a huge mess uh, whenever uh, politicians head out on the campaign trail for obvious reasons. You need to simplify your own message. You need to caricature your opponent. You need to do all the things that that um, uh, don't allow for thoughtful conversation. I actually just wrote another column for our next issue of McLean's in which I say that uh, um, uh, municipal politics in, in Canada is often, by comparison, uh, a, a much more encouraging space. Um, uh, uh, party lines are not as stark. Uh, um, new coalitions need to be built around every decision, and therefore there's a lot more give and take, which means a lot more mm -hmm. tendency to uh, acknowledge um, the the viewpoint of, of of your opponent and to try and integrate that. And concerned citizens can mobilize alternatives and uh, make life difficult in real ways for incumbents, which means that incumbents are much more like, likely to need to pay attention to concerned citizens. Um, uh, having laid out a, what, what, you, what you, I think, properly called a pessimistic uh, uh, perspective in, in answer to the first question, <laughs> Canada actually now has uh, real substantial advantages compared to a lot of uh, our peer uh, countries uh, in, in terms of where we stand now. We've got a good story to tell about this pandemic, the second lowest uh, um, uh, death rate in the G7 after Japan, the highest rate of vaccination, last time I checked, um, um, and public finances that are not in crisis state, uh, largely thanks to the discipline that was shown by the four prime ministers before Justin Trudeau, who, who ensured that there would be uh, low public debt and that we could sustain the sort of astonishing increase in public spending that we uh, just came out of. We've got uh, resilient social capital in this country, people who tend to trust their neighbors. Um, that was shown by whatever else happened in the last federal uh, election campaign. Um, uh, extreme fringe uh, party alternatives were not really entertained by the voters who stuck close to the uh, the traditional center brokerage parties, which are still seen, mm -hmm. as, seen as legitimate. Um, NDP, liberal and conservative. Uh, and, and, and so um, uh, electorates behave that way in countries where people have not uh, despaired of uh, the traditional answers to big questions and have not completely given up faith on uh, in, in, in the sort of same old political faces. Uh, we've seen examples of that in Brexit Britain, in Trump's America. Uh, and 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 um, the 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 fact that uh, you know voters have lived through everything that we've seen and are and are by and large returning um, uh, sort of traditional uh, political parties with traditional answers to these questions suggests a level of social capital that I think will prove valuable going forward. So we've got a, I mean, we're in a tough spot, and I don't think I don't think we can sort of snap our fingers and 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 enter a new era, but we have. Uh, assets that will prove valuable in meeting these challenges. Carol, thank you, Paul. Uh, Carol, Paul has just spoken about the power of municipalities. I, I find this quite interesting. Uh, talk to us about the barriers that municipalities are facing right now. I mean, we're, we're I think, more than 18 months into the pandemic, but, but looking at rec recovery, what are the barriers that they're telling you about? 
Yeah, it's a it's a great question, and uh, you know, no, no surprise to you that I also agree with Paul that local government really gives rise to optimism and and is a really powerful tool um, for uh, building the kinds of bridges for for piloting the kinds of ideas that we need to see. I mean, truly, our our communities, our cities are are, are living labs for how we're going to be able to advance some pretty complex uh, complex um, solutions that are required to to even greater challenges. And so, um, you know, I, I support all of that. And I, you know, again, have a bird's eye view across the country of local government and, and really see in real time the way that communities are, are advancing these solutions. And so that does give rise to optimism. Uh, here's my turn to be um, a bit of a pessimist, though. I Ultimately, I think we're going to get, <laughs> we're going to figure out a way to get past this as a country, because the barrier question is real, Manjula, and it's a good one, right? And I, I'll start by saying, you know, this, this pandemic, Boy, did we see the vulnerability of our biggest cities, of our communities across the country very quickly. I mean, we were, uh, you know, municipalities were on the verge of real financial crisis very quickly. Um, you know, we're, we're have no ability to run a deficit at a local government level, um, rely on a property tax that is regressive. And then we uh, are heavily reliant on operating, um, you know, transit being a great example of money that comes in um, through the fare box. And so, Put a put a pandemic um, in front of us, and very quickly, without the, the significant uh, drop in in operating revenue for municipalities, without the ability to count on that, we had major municipalities, major cities, as well as the smaller ones. Um, thinking about how are we going to cut services? How, what are we going to do? We're, we're just quite simply can't do this. And we're forced to turn to other orders of government to say, you know, we need help. And this is something that was a reality ahead of the pandemic, you know, that municipalities, given the modern role of local government right now, what they are increasingly relied on to deliver. Um, the fact of the matter is we're not resourced in, in a way that meets that. Uh, and that has been exacerbated. You know, right now, even right now, one of the, the real time barriers that we're continuing to have conversations with the provincial and federal order of government is around transit operating costs. You know, a city like Toronto is facing an $800 million like hole. You can't blow a tire out of a city like that and not expect mm. that there are going to be consequences, that that's going to impact our ability to deliver the kind of economic development, the kind of forward-looking ideas that need to drive a recovery going forward. And so I would say, you know, the biggest barrier right now um, is that we are sort of within, living within as an order of government, a fairly outdated model of work, given what our modern reality is. And that, you know, we always get the red herring here thrown into the conversation of, are you talking about then some constitutional change? And, you know, I just, I honestly think that's a red herring. We are so well, um, we haven't tested the limits at all of what's possible within our constitutional framework. There's a lot of room for creativity. We started to prove that in the course of this, this pandemic. Um, and so I, I hope we can advance a conversation about how to get municipalities the appropriate finances, uh, the appropriate tools, the appropriate authorities um, to really lean in. And I, I just think the regions that are going to figure out how to get that right and, and Canada as a country, if we can do that, um, then we're going to really empower ourselves to, to be leaders on the international stage. What's interesting, you know, you, you're talking about some of the issues that, that we have in, in this path to recovery. Uh, I have to tell you a story. So I was in Thornbury, Ontario recently, beautiful town close to Georgian Bay. And I heard that restaurants there were offering workers at other eateries uh, $1,000 to jump ship. Uh, that's in a town of something like 7,000 or 8,000 people. I mean, just goes to speak to the, and there were signs at restaurants talking about, you know, be patient, uh, you know, we don't have uh, the, the workers that we ought to have uh, for today's sitting. There's a widespread labor shortage across the country, across various sectors. What is the impact um, that this has on, on recovery? Uh, Paul, I, I don't know if you have, if you want to comment on that. Sure. Um you see it at any time you basically leave your house. I uh, have been driving between Ottawa and Montreal a fair bit lately, and at Tim Hortons, uh, all along the highway, there's uh, there's signs saying, you know, boy, mm -hmm. we would sure like to hire you if you'd like to work here. Um, <laughs> this is a this is a transitional moment, and um, for reasons that have been discussed, some of the income support programs that make it possible to choose to stay home rather than um, uh, taking uh, uh, 
part-time work or, 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 or low wage work and, and, and various others, which incidentally is not uh, a lazy or terrible uh, choice to make. It's a rational choice to make. And, uh, um, uh, but, but also um, uh, people are hesitant to, 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 to be out in public, which means that the customers who support a lot of these businesses are reluctant to go out and be customers. Um, uh, we're, we're in a, 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 a difficult time economically. I think to some extent that will correct over the next year by itself. And, 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 and a lot of these uh, shortages and, and challenges are going to ease. And I think they will be all the likelier to ease if um, we can uh, encourage everyone who's uh, has a chance to do so to I- increase their um, skills, uh, reskill through uh, short term or longer term training, vocational training, uh, and uh, government programs that support that at the provincial or federal level make a lot of sense so that people will be able to participate in this huge reshuffling of the of the workforce that we're seeing at the blue collar level and to a much lesser extent uh, at other levels of the economy. Uh, and that's uh, that's obviously a plug for uh, for the kind of work that the, the member institutions of CI Canada do. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, people who find themselves with time on their hands, being able to take some of that time to go out and build up their human capital uh, is always a good idea and all the more so in, at, at a time like now. Thank you, Paul. And, and and you having said that, I think we should welcome some leaders from the college sector into this conversation. Uh, so joining us now is uh, Denise Amio. She was just with us, the president and CEO of Colleges and Institutes Canada, and Don Lavisa. He's the president of Durham College and a member of the CI Can Board of Directors. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. So Hello. good to have both of you here. Hello. Uh, Don Denise, you've been listening to Carolyn Paul. There's there's so much that they that they've put forward here. Uh, perhaps you disagree, or you have some questions for them. Uh, would you like to weigh in on what they've shared, Don? I'll I'll start with you. Uh, yes, thank you. First of all, I have to say it's quite an honor to be uh, on a panel with Carolyn Paul, quite distinguished guest. And I also have to say how nice it is to have Manjula uh, moderating this session, as Manjula is an alumni of distinction from Durham College's journalism program. So we're very proud of Angela and her success. So, you know, um, your questions, your answers were very broad and and, provide, and really went across a number of issues. I want to challenge you on one issue. The, the opportunity, uh, you both talked, from one from an optimistic, one from a pessimistic point of view, about the opportunities, about the transformation of our economy, a transformation of our country. If you look at CI CAN, there's 670 campuses across this country, and most of those campuses are within about a, a 50 kilometer radius of indigenous and, and population communities. And as we look across this country, and you talk about transformation opportunity, how do you ensure that this is balanced? Carol, you talked about small towns. I grew up in Fort Francis, Ontario, 8,000 people. I went home this summer. It doesn't look like the same opportunity exists for them. And if you live outside of uh, outside of the GTA and you live up north, one thing that we learned at the colleges when we when we went to online is the amount of people that just couldn't do online because they didn't have the infrastructure to do it, or the wealth to 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 buy computers, multiple computers in some cases. So just unpack that a little bit more about you know where do you see the opportunity for for really across Canada, and uh, and uh, again, Paul, you're a little bit more pessimistic, you know. What are the other challenges that we need to face and have a discussion about? Paul, I think if you could, if I, I, I didn't mean to stamp you with this this pessimistic sign, but <laughs> seems to be staying now. So I, I, I mean, I've been called here. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, obviously, this is an important point. Obviously, um, opportunity can't be. Um, uh, understood to be opportunity if it's available only to a small segment of society. And uh, the more um, um, the economy can grow and recover and be resilient, the more it, uh, these benefits can be extended to people who've been um, and, uh, and populations and nations who have historically been uh, left out. Um, that's 
that's an element of what I was trying to get at my first piece, my first answer, which is that um, the the uh, obvious bells and whistles of a, of, a, of, a, of a bright and fantastic future, which essentially almost always when when federal politicians talk about building back better, what they essentially mean is um, uh, green urban infrastructure, which is nice to have, uh, but is so far from being the total picture. Uh, an awful lot of Canadians don't live in downtowns. An awful lot of Canadians are not commuters. An awful lot of Canadians uh, are uh, um, eager, if not desperate, to experience the first glimpses of economic opportunity, which means a local job or, um, uh, a, 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 or an internet connection or uh, a, a chance to uh, acquire the skills that they need in ways that are respectful of cultural difference and, and heritage uh, to allow them to participate in uh, any kind of re recovery that, 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 that we might be able to, to hope for. And um, that's why I'm increasingly interested in a notion that doesn't usually appeal to me, which is taking this debate well outside the corridors of power into some sort mm -hmm. of multi-sectoral conversation. Uh, next week in Ottawa, there's something called the uh, the uh, the Summit for a Better Future, which is organized by just a long list of think tanks, associations. I'd be a little surprised if the two associations that are represented here, CICAN and um, uh, Federation of Canadian Municipalities, aren't represented at this. Uh, Lisa Raitt and um, Anne McClellan are the sort of co-chairs uh, of the event. But um, it represents the kind of large uh, cross-cutting conversation that we haven't had enough of lately in Canada for obvious reasons. It's hard to get together. Um, I, I am nervous whenever uh, federal politicians believe that among them they, they have the answers to questions like this. I don't think even federal provincial uh, meetings and, and conference calls come close to being inclusive enough. If we're going to get correct answers to what we need as a society, I think we need a very broad um, uh, you know, almost a Future of Canada Summit type events. And that's why this Coalition for a Better Future event uh, next week in, in, in Ottawa is, I, I think, an, um, uh, an interesting uh, model for some of the conversations we need to be having. Well, well Denise, fact, uh, to answer, go ahead. To answer go ahead. Your I, I was actually going to call on you to comment on that. Yeah. <laughs> To answer your questions, Paul, we will be participating, in fact, uh, and I'm sure Carol is uh, as well. Um, I want to go back to something you said, Paul, earlier, uh, when you talk about uh, the Second World War. And when you said that there was no issue with respect to infrastructure because during the war it was destroyed, while this time it stayed the same. Hmm. Does that mean it is in the best possible way? I dare to say no, uh, because in fact, the infrastructure we have, if I just look at the college and institute system, it's uh, old infrastructure. It's not necessarily green, except maybe one of the building. It's not necessarily accessible uh, in uh, to, to go everywhere for the students or the, the faculty. So I, I, I would be tempted to say that, in fact, when we looked at opportunities to build back better, to build, uh, to think about the future, would be investment in physical infrastructure uh, to ensure that it is green and accessible also digital infrastructure this uh, and carol mentioned it earlier this pandemic showed that you cannot not have broadband everywhere uh, the government talked about uh, at one point that it would be 95 percent in five years and then in 10 years 100 percent honestly we cannot wait we cannot wait that long because the pandemic has shown that it is an essential service and it's essential for everybody so and finally, I would dare to say that with respect to opportunities, uh, if there would be additional funding 
for the more vulnerable population. Because when we, we did a survey just prior to the pandemic with respect to what was blocking people to, to pursue education because they were saying they wanted to continue uh, their education. And number one, at 80%, it was lack of funding. And sometimes it was not necessarily just the tuition fees, but it was transportation or daycare. And this is really the vulnerable population that is the most affected. So just imagine what it could be if this would not be a barrier and then it could solve the other problem that was raised earlier, which is a shortage of labor. Uh, because if people would have the chance to go to get those micro credentials, for example, there would be possibility for them to maybe access some of the jobs that are available. Well, Denise, you've you've started us off on on uh, a footing that I wanted to, to take us to to you know how do we what needs to happen to ensure that an economic and social uh, recovery happens that is inclusive and sustainable and and you started by putting some um, some solutions on the table. Um, Carol, maybe I'll I'll start with you here. What do you think needs to happen again to make that recovery that we're talking about, given the barriers that have been mentioned in this conversation? with the hat that you have, um, how do we make sure that, that it is inclusive and uh, sustainable? Thanks, well, it's, uh, you know, I think I can answer in a way that, that pulls some of these threads together because I, I agree very much with, with the pieces that we've heard from, from all three other um, panelists here, you know, and, and Don, your question I think is very much tied to this as well. How do we make sure that we're doing this really right across the country from coast to coast to coast? And, um, you know, again, to Paul's point that we need to have a much broader conversation um, as a country about this than, than solely at a federal level. And so I think that speaks to the fact that the recovery really needs to be rooted in real communities, the places where people live, where we work, where we raise our families, where we start businesses. And that, you know, again, not surprising for me, but I, I think you're hearing the sort of validation of this, that local government, we see what's needed on the ground and that empowering uh, us to deliver frontline solutions in, in the communities right across the country that are tailored to the varying needs across the country is, is going to be really important and, and, and sort of efficient um, and have the kind of national impact on inclusion and sustainability. You know, there are a number of um, very frontline solutions that we're, we're putting forward um, as an order of government on everything from, you know, when you, again, to, to Paul's point, looking at um, any issue, take transit. Yes, there is a very real an acute need in the biggest cities. Um, and we pushed hard and have successfully made the permanent transit fund uh, now include also uh, regional and remote, remote transportation networks. You know, that's the kind of lens we're going to need to bring to the conversations across the board on climate, uh, you know, from mitigation, but also to resilience, also to adaptation. Uh, how, how can we localize pathways to net zero when we're talking about this in a big conversation? And, and you know, the, any issue, I mean, housing, again, Again, like it's another issue where you've got to really consider the spectrum, um, both of, of the housing challenges and also sort of the reach that we need to have across the country in the very, very, the very context. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'll say this, I'll take maybe, uh, you know, I, I think it's a bit of a both and. I agree with with Paul around the necessity of, of the broader conversations um, that we go, that we need to have as a country across sectors, multi-sectoral uh, conversation is critical. And I also think in tandem, we need stronger intergovernmental coordination. I mean, this this is the kinds of conversations that are coming up and yes, FCM will, will be represented there is are, are critical, uh, but also where, where the conversations need to really be happening is between the orders of government as well. Um, in terms of how we advance advance these conversations. And, you know, I don't know if we're, we're going to have time or if you intend to get there, but, you know, when we talk about what an equitable uh, an inclusive future needs to look at, especially for a country like ours, I think we've really got to bring in the, the notion of reconciliation. What does that mean? You know, there's a real link in here, again, for, for the post-secondary world. Uh, you know, we're one of the youngest and fastest growing populations in Canada, our Indigenous peoples. Um, and I really think, you know, we have, again, here's here's the heartburn and opportunity and beyond the moral imperative to do this. 
it is the smart thing for us to do as a country uh, to help and invest and create a, a more level playing field so that Indigenous youth can be a big part of bridging us to a new economy in a more equitable way. And so I'll pause there, but I, I do think, um, you know, we to the, where, I, where I start, we've got to, across jurisdictions, across sectors, we've got to figure out how to get out of our own way and how to have the real conversations based on the on the ground realities of what people need. And I, I, you know, I would suggest that that deep engagement of local government is a good place to start for that. Um, Don, uh, Carol just mentioned it. I mean, we just marked the first national day for truth and reconciliation um, recently. Don, what should our priorities be for improving the prosperity, health and education of, of indigenous communities and, and people across the country? You know, there's so much work to be done in that area. I mean, it starts by by listening and by learning and the colleges and institutes across Canada can play a big role in that by ensuring that we are embedding Indigenous history into our curriculum, by ensuring that our populations understand the, the history as well and, uh, and that we all contribute to the solution. You know, one of the things that occurs to me, and I worked in Northern Ontario for a long time and I had the opportunity to visit a lot of Indigenous communities and you know, we're talking about opportunity and a transformation of the economy, but we also have, have to help Indigenous communities build an economy. Many of those communities have no economy, and therefore it makes it much more difficult for them to participate. So how do we ensure that our solutions uh, help Indigenous communities participate in the economy? Um, as colleges and institutes, we, we do uh, try our best to ensure that they are uh, participating in education, advancing their skills, which is also an opportunity to, to improve, um, um, improve opportunities for themselves as, as young people coming up. And it is a young population. There's a huge opportunity for us as a country. But we, we need, again, we need to start to listen. We need to action, speaks loud in words. And uh, we need to ensure that we find a way working with the Indigenous communities to help them build opportunities for, for all the communities right across this country. You, know, you go to BC and you see the economies built by some of the BC First Nation communities, they're incredible. But then if you go into Northern Ontario, you don't see that same opportunity. And we have to figure this out. We have to get people, Indigenous people involved in these conversations. Paul, you know, when I look at some of the priority issues that that have come up in conversation, some that we should have been having, like this conversation about, uh, you know, our relationship with Indigenous communities and what we do for Indigenous communities, we should have been having for years now. But but there are some priority issues that that have come up in the last couple of months, you know, be it uh, climate change, uh, concerns about equity, or the fact that, you know, you have this workforce and struggles with the workforce in a rapidly evolving a job market. I'd be curious to know because you watch so many things and, and you move in, in in so many circles. What trends um, that that have emerged over the last two years and especially through the pandemic do you think are here to stay? Um, so I think let me move back one step and you say you know how could we ensure that 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 opportunity and change is. Um, uh, you know, widespread, generalized, uh, open to everyone, and 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 the first thing to do is to ask the question, and the second thing to do is to is to never stop asking the question, uh, and 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 I would point to that as one of the trends that 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 you ask about. Um, uh, we're talking largely about Indigenous Canadians. Um, not only uh, have the rest of us begun to understand our obligations towards Indigenous Canadians better than before. Uh, it's becoming clearer and clearer that, that, uh, that those obligations are never going to be going away. That until these injustices, these inequalities are uh, durably addressed in ways that will often be uncomfortable for other Canadians, um, that, uh, that these questions are going to keep coming up. Uh, and, and in um, uh, persistent institutional ways, the courts have made it clear again and again and again, they're not going to accept uh, overlooking or ignoring uh, legal obligations towards Indigenous Canadians. The uh, five-year struggle to get this federal government to in, in, uh, entrench the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples uh, in Canadian law, um, uh, that step 
implies uh, many other steps, um, uh, a, 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 a top to bottom rethink of the Canadian legal apparatus um, mm. uh, driven from the federal government, but nudged along by the courts that will uh, ensure that we can't walk away from the legal implications of the UN declaration uh, uh, in other aspects of Canadian law. And then uh, finally making sure that um, uh, fewer of these conversations involve non-Indigenous Canadians reminding one another of our obligations and more of these conversations mm -hmm. uh, include Indigenous Canadians, uh, not just um, um, reminding one another of, of, of past injustices, but working on practical uh, solutions for uh, future opportunity that is shared by everyone. Maybe, Madam Go Julia, ahead. I, I, I'd like to talk about something that maybe people often are not aware with respect to Indigenous education in the college system. And it's not perfect, but there have been very good results. So let me give you some examples. So at the diploma level, the percentage of Indigenous that have a diploma is the same percentage as the number of non-Indigenous that have a diploma. At the trade level, it is 1% more that are Indigenous that have a, a trade uh, certification. At the degree level, unfortunately, it's lower. And uh, I cannot tell you what's the percentage for college because unfortunately, Stats Canada still do not distinguish the degree from a college versus the degree from a university. That said, because of the locations of colleges, we know that the number of Indigenous people attending colleges is quite high relatively speaking, if you compare to a uh, university uh, level. And the, what I have observed in my eight years in my job is that there has been an evolution with respect to Indigenous education. So we do, for example, an Indigenous education symposium every year. When we first started this, the people attending the symposium were people in charge of indigenous education. Now, more and more, we see people coming from different disciplines. We see more presidents attending the symposium, more vice presidents attending, because people realize that education is part of the solutions when you talk about um, reconciliation. And as Don said earlier, it's important to uh, talk about Indigenous not only in the uh, program tailored uh, for Indigenous people, but in all programs, even if you uh, teach mathematics or physics, you talk about the canoe and how uh, great an invention it, it is from a gravity point of view. Uh, and you. So, uh, you know, do you talk about the, the facilities to ensure people recognize themselves that there is a place to, to go? And what we have learned throughout the years is that, in fact, more you do with respect to indigenous educations to indigenize, if you want, your institution, better it is for the entire populations because, because people feel uh, more safe, it, they feel it is inclusive. And all the, the, the people that felt they, they, there were barriers or they, they didn't feel included, they feel that no, there, there can be a niche for them too. Thank you. Can I, um, can I jump in very Of course, please, yes. Yeah, and I, I know you're managing time, so I'll be I'll try to be very brief here. I, I just wanted to say, you know, to to Paul's point here, I, I mean, the, our job really is is to listen and and thankfully we've got a very clear roadmap. It's not that Indigenous leaders aren't telling us 
what we need to do. Mm -hmm. The TRC has put out a very comprehensive set of, set of um, calls to action that we need to, across sectors, across government, internalize, and certainly we're spending a lot of time doing that. And so we've, we've got a roadmap from Indigenous leaders, and no surprise, it also includes investment in quality of life, in access to clean water, in healthcare, in education, and employment opportunities. I mean, you know, it, it really, I think in the conversation, it isn't a mystery. <laughs> we've just got to um, do the work, and we've got to, a big part of that work is first listening, is learning is building those respectful relationships but but then we've got to got to start prioritizing in often uncomfortable ways to Paul's point um, and make the decisions that are going to get there and I'm I'm just glad that you know Denise has talked to sort of um, the changing story in a post-secondary education context um, because we really need to to prioritize um, making a reality that Indigenous youth are, are helping us bridge the gap, helping us drive a new economy, um, because that's uh, that's what our country needs beyond it being the right thing to do. Thank you, Carol. Um, we are getting close to the at the end of this. Unfortunately, it's such a rich discussion. I'd I'd love to keep going for longer, but I think uh, Denise, I'm going to put the put my uh, last question to you here. This was a, a statistic that that John brought up earlier. It's from a briefing by CI Can to the House of Commons Standing Committee in Finance. So you must be familiar with it. Um, it's that over 95 percent of Canadians and 86 percent of Indigenous people live within 50 kilometers of a college. Um, institute, uh, SAGEP, or or Polytechnic. You know, having said that, you know, we're talking about the the power of municipalities, where we have the right people on in the conversation here from colleges and institutes. What is your sense for the role that post-secondary institutions can play as we emerge out of this pandemic? And I hate to have to say this to you, you'll have to make that in one minute or less. Okay, we have a report on that. <laughs> and we'll make sure that uh, we have people that can look at it because, in fact, uh, the college system is a powerhouse that can help with uh, access, that can help with people that want to upskill or reskill, and that can help entrepreneurs that uh, are facing a labor shortage. Last thing we didn't talk about that I need to talk about is the importance of colleges with respect to immigrant integration. In fact, yesterday we published a new report that is accessible on our website with respect to what is needed. We're making three specific recommendations with respect to uh, what is needed to, in fact, increase the immigrant integrations, because this is also part of the solutions with respect to labor shortage. I should add a, a word to our audience that um, that CI Can has just released an important position paper. That's the paper that uh, that Denise just referred to. It's called "The Role of Newcomers and International Students in Driving a Canadian Economic Growth." And of course, if you find, want to find out more about any of all of the key initiatives in place within and for uh, post-secondary uh, education, led by CI Can, by the government and other national and international stakeholders, there is a, a resource for that. Subscribe for free to CI Can's bi-monthly newsletter, uh, Perspectives. Uh, we, of course, would love to hear your perspectives, uh, questions, comments on the discussion that we've had today. Uh, we invite you to do so by email um, at this address appearing on the screen, perspectives at collegesinstitutes.ca. Thank you to our guest today, um, Denise Amio, President and CEO of Colleges and Institutes Canada, Don Lavisa, good to see you again, uh, the president of Durham College and member of the of the CI Can Board of Directors. Uh, Carol Saab, CEO of Federation of Canadian Municipalities, who probably has to rush off back to her own conference on sustainable communities soon. And Paul Wells, senior editor of McLean's. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you for tuning in. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to our audience. And do know that we're on back next month uh, on Wednesday, November the 24th, for the next episode of Perspectives Live on the following hot topic. Are we moving the needle on climate change? Good day and stay safe.